uh, I would like to, uh, to go to the second presentation, uh, and that is a presentation by uh, Matt Glisson. Uh, Matt is a principal engineer with uh, Braun Intertech in uh, St. Louis, and he is a leader of the company's uh, Deep Foundation Group. Uh, and as part of that, he assists in developing and evaluating policies that guide the geotechnical engineers of the firm. And one of the projects that he's been involved with is the I-35 West uh, Bridge Project. And again, uh, it clearly demonstrated, as he will show you, that uh, using load testing uh, saves money and then time. And with that, Matt, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gerald. Uh, make sure that everybody can see my screen uh, before I go too far here. Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, how the use of load testing on the I-35W bridge project not only saved money, but did save time, uh, demonstrating further, I guess, uh, what Van's presentation showed you all. So a little bit of an overview of my, my presentation. Uh, talk a little bit about the collapse of the bridge, uh, the design of the new bridge, the subsurface conditions that we had at the project, the initial foundation design, the load test program that we undertook and the resulting costs and savings of those uh, load tests and or of the load tests, excuse me, and uh, the actual final production shafts that were installed. Interstate 35 is the major north-south thoroughfare through the state of Minnesota, excuse me, and as it gets into the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, it does split into a uh, east and west portion with the Interstate 35E, which would be the eastern side, going through downtown St. Paul, and the western one, I-35W, going through downtown Minneapolis. The yellow pin on your screen here shows the actual location of the bridge over the Mississippi River, uh, right in the central core area of the city of Minneapolis. So here is uh, what happened uh, the evening of August 1st in 2007. Uh, these are some screenshots taken from a camera that the US Army Corps of Engineer has along the lower lock and dam of St. Anthony Falls. Switching up here a little bit. Um, this is a picture of the bridge shortly after uh, the original bridge was constructed. Uh, you can see that uh, the embankments for the roadways are still being worked upon here. But here is the Interstate 35 bridge. This bridge here is the 10th Avenue bridge, which uh, still remains to this day. Uh, this is the lower lock for the lower St. Anthony Falls. We've got the upper St. Anthony Falls and, and lock up here on the right side of the picture. A couple other things that I want to point out. Uh, there are some major industrial facilities that are nearby the bridge site, including a Unoco bulk facility, uh, Minneapolis coal gasification plant, Metalmatics here on the North Bank, as well as the University of Minnesota uh, steam facility and hazardous materials uh, waste storage. Here's the picture uh, showing, looking north. Uh, so we've got the, the lower lock structure here uh, showing the bridge shortly after the collapse. Um, it was built in 1967 and at the time of its collapse was the third busiest bridge in the state, carrying an average of 140,000 vehicles per day. Uh, when it collapsed in the evening, um, the lanes actually were reduced due to some construction maintenance work that was going on on the bridge, but in all, uh, 111 vehicles fell into the uh, river channel, uh, about 115 feet that they fell, along with uh, that construction equipment, materials, and unfortunately some construction workers as well. Over 145 people were injured during the collapse. 13 people lost their lives, including many of the construction workers. As I mentioned, it was the third busiest bridge in the state. And as such, MnDOT estimated, Minnesota Department of Transportation that is, estimated that the out of service cost to the state was about $400,000 per day. Uh, so quickly, early on in the, the process of figuring out uh, how to replace this bridge, MnDOT identified that a, an advanced accelerated construction schedule was going to be advantageous. They chose to go with the design build uh, uh, procurement method, uh, the apparent best cost uh, approach that they had. Um, in their RFP, they did require that instead of it being a single uh, structure, that it would be a twin bridge to replace the previous bridge. 
uh, increase the required design life. The original bridge had a 50 year design life. It was well beyond that uh, when it collapsed, but uh, the new bridge did have a requirement for uh, a design life of 125 years. The overall length of the new bridge structure at 1,223 feet is actually shorter than the previous bridge, and I'll explain why here in, in my next slide. Um, but the overall combined width of 176 feet between the two structures was a dramatic increase. And lastly, for the foundations, MnDOT did require that the river piers or river substructures be supported on drilled shafts and then left uh, the abutments and any other substructure uh, foundation options to the contractor to choose. The successful bidder was a joint venture between Flatiron Construction and Manson Construction, uh, with FIG Bridge Engineers and TKDA being the lead, lead bridge designers, and my firm, Braun Intertech, being the lead uh, geotechnical, environmental, and materials testing firm for the joint venture. Very quickly, the joint venture team did identify that for most of the substructures, we did want to use drilled shafts, um, but we were able to utilize driven H piles at the south abutment, which is the abutment one structure shown here in the bridge elevation. So this is the south end of the bridge moving to the north as you move to the right. As I mentioned before, the, the uh, replacement bridge did have a shorter span, and that's because the design team chose to not have the bridge span all the way over 2nd Street as a continuous structure to the south, but actually build an MSE embankment between the existing railroad tracks and 2nd Streets, um, thereby shortening the bridge and, and speeding up some of the construction uh, that we had into it. The cross section here in the bottom shows that it was a concrete box uh, structure, precast post-tension structure that was built. The final design included five lanes of traffic in each direction, but it also added in shoulders that were not in the previous bridge, which was only three lanes in each direction. So it did have the does have the capacity of, of seven lanes if, if need be. Another thing to note uh, from a design perspective is that the interior lanes are actually designed to support light rail transit. Uh, City of Minneapolis and St. Paul have been doing quite a bit of construction of new uh, light rail transit throughout the, the region and they did want to be able to include that um, on this new bridge. Another picture here to help orient everybody to uh, the project. Uh, so this is actually during construction after the foundations have all been con constructed, but uh, it shows just how the twin bridge structures were going to, to lay out. We've got the south abutment or abutment one here in the foreground of the picture. The pier element for the southbound structure at pier two and the northbound structure. Pier three here on the north side of the river. The actual test pile program was conducted right here just off of the pier three northbound structure. And then here are the railroad tracks uh, that were right near the north abutment and then second street here beyond that. So the subsurface conditions in uh, at the bridge site are actually pretty typical for a project located along or over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. Uh, many buildings in downtown Minneapolis are supported on the Platteville limestone, either directly uh, with spread footings or uh, drilled shafts, depending on the amount of surficial deposits and fill. At the actual bridge site, the surficial deposits and fill were about 25 feet in thickness. But as you can see, as you move closer to the river channel itself, the Mississippi River actually did erode away the Platteville limestone, the Glenwood shale, and a significant portion of the St. Peter sandstone. As the notes here indicate, we did have artesian conditions uh, encountered at about elevation 635, so just below uh, the bottom of this uh, sketch here. And then one of the reasons that uh, drilled shafts and driven piles were used were due to the environmental challenges from those previous facilities that I pointed out earlier. Uh, it would make significant uh, costs to dispose of the hazardous material and the soils uh, to use spread footings, even though the south abutment actually is sitting right here over the Glenwood Shale, and it wasn't that far down to the limestone and sandstone at some of the northern structures. The initial design for the drilled shafts on this project was based on AASHTO FHWA methodology. As is typical with sandstone, uh, the RQD and unconfined compressor strengths vary dramatically. It's a relatively challenging material to core, 
uh, not uncommon that it does have such challenges. But you can see here in the table that you know our side shear ranged from half a kip per square foot up to 10 kips per square foot, and our end bearing ranged from 60 to 150 kips per square foot. So that resulted, these values resulted in our initial designs for piers two and three having a rock socket diameter of 84 inches and a 96 inch diameter uh, socket at uh, pier four. The initial test shaft um, proposed at uh, pier three had a tip elevation of 632. MnDOT did require the project to perform uh, both a test shaft and a method shaft. The method shaft had to have a diameter that was at least 75% of the uh, planned design diameter. The joint venture team did ask for and receive permission to combine the test and method shaft and do it all as one, as the specifications for the project did not include any diameter requirements for the test shaft itself. Um, the test shaft had a design diameter as shown here as being 78 inches, which would have been 80% of uh, the, the initial design diameter of 96 inches. It actually wound up being closer to 87%, 85, 87% of the actual final design diameters that were selected for the project. The rock socket overall length was 39 feet. Uh, we did have uh, multiple levels of uh, bi-directional uh, assemblies, jack assemblies, Osterberg cells, working with load tests to do that. Um, the reasons for that I'll get into as I discuss this more, but um, lower assembly and upper assembly and multiple levels of strain gauges and telltales to help us identify and determine the actual nominal unit resistance of the different strata that we were in. We knew that the upper portion of the St. Peter sandstone was what we'll call a less competent material the lower portion was a, a more competent material, as we termed it. And then we also did want to make sure that we were getting uh, as much good quality uh, information out of the end bearing as well. I mentioned a couple times now, the initial test shaft um, had a design of a tip elevation of 632. And going back to the artesian conditions, um, in the borings that we did for the project and that others did for the project, there was only about five feet or so, maybe up to 10 feet at one location of artesian head uh, over the existing ground surface. When uh, Case Foundations actually started installing the test shaft um, and got down below the artesian condition or into the artesian conditions, the actual height of artesian head was 15 feet over the existing ground surface, which was going to cause uh, significant challenges to construction of the drilled shafts, particularly at piers three and four. So the decision was made to abandon the initial test shaft, install a second test shaft with a toe elevation or tip elevation brought up to this 645 level. A couple things to point out in far, as far as assembling the actual test shaft itself and the reinforcing cage and the load cell assemblies. Um, the decision was made to divide uh, or to break up the reinforcing cage into two sections due to weight and height and, and lift restrictions that they had with the equipment that they were going to be using for the majority of the project. So the lower section was uh, the testing section that had the two levels of O-cell assemblies. In order to ensure that the Tremi pipe made it through the hole that was placed in the upper and lower plates around each of the assemblies, contractor installed these cones of rebar. You can see it clearly here at the upper end. It is visible if you look closely at the lower end on the left side there. But just one of the tech tools that was uh, taken into consideration for how to build the actual test shaft, a little bit of a deviation from the production shafts is we weren't going to have all these load cell assemblies in the production shafts. Um, but we were able to, with uh, CSL testing, validate that we did get good concrete all the way down the sh shaft. The load test program was broken into three stages uh, using the two levels of assemblies. And that was, again, to ensure that we were actually testing all of the different uh, zones that we were interested in identifying the nominal unit resistances of. So the whole deal with uh, bi-directional loading is that instead of putting your load cell assembly and, and loading equipment and everything at the top of the pile and having to use a reaction frame that revol involves additional construction, you're actually going to use the weight 
and skin friction or end bear and or end bearing of the shaft that it has itself to be the loading and resisting portions of your test shaft. So for the initial stage, stage one, we were going to close the upper assembly so that it wasn't going to take any additional fluid, it wasn't going to have any expansion, and we were gonna pressurize the lower assembly to test the end bearing resistance utilizing the skin friction along all of the portion of the shaft above the lower assembly. In the second stage, we're gonna let this load cell or this cell assembly at the bottom remain open, free to deflect, while we pressurize this middle section, which would allow us to use the skin friction above this upper assembly to test the skin friction between the two uh, load cell assemblies. In the third stage, which is actually termed 2A, 2B, we are going to lock off the lower assembly and continue pressurizing the upper assembly, thereby using the skin friction uh, in the lower section along with the end bearing resistance to mobilize and test the uh, skin friction in the upper portion of the shaft. So a picture here of the load test uh, going on, and I, I chose this picture at night, not just to demonstrate uh, or illustrate the beautiful downtown Minneapolis night skyline, but also to demonstrate that this project went 24 hours a day, seven days a week, except for the week between Christmas Eve and New Year's. Uh, this load test actually was performed during Thanksgiving day. So this picture is actually taken in the evening of, of Thanksgiving. Right back here, this is the actual test shaft. This is the upper portion of the can, uh, temporary casing that was left in at the upper reaches of the shaft. Some of the instrumentation used here by load test to monitor the shaft movement. Part of the reason for the project going 24 hours a day and seven days a week was due to an incentive clause that MnDOT put in the contract. Again, I mentioned earlier that MnDOT estimated the cost of the bridge being out of service was $400,000 a day. So MnDOT did include an incentive cause, as I said, in the contract of up to 104, excuse me, not up to, but of $140,000 per day, up to 90 days early completion. So this bridge from the time that, Min, uh, that uh, MnDOT and the joint ventures signed their agreement, the bridge was constructed in nine months, uh, resulting in three months early savings so that Min, uh, the joint venture did uh, realize the full 90 day early incentive. Results of the load test uh, in terms of uh, typical load displacement curves that you might see. This is a result, uh, this is from the initial stage, so testing the end bearing. Um, we did have significant permanent deformation, so plastic deformation of the base of the shaft. Turned out that we did not have to utilize um, a cutout section of the lower plate assembly where we had it isolated to just one of the load cells, the O cells that uh, where we didn't identify that we did not have enough skin friction above that lower assembly to mobilize the full nominal resistance of the shaft, we could uh, test a smaller area and have that, that load applied. Ultimately, it was decided to limit uh, the end bearing to a displacement of 0.7 inches. So that is the value that you'll see later on as far as the unit resistance goes. And again, uh, some more graphs showing the results of the load test. These are the results of the stage two and stage three, or stage 2A and 2B, depending on uh, who you go by. But looking at the side resistance values that we got uh, from the testing. So to summarize the three different stages that we went through as far as design of the shafts. We had our initial design, was based on the 0.5 to 10 kips per square foot of side shear and the 60 to 150 KSF of end bearing. The actual test shaft, the initial test shaft design, used two to eight kips per square foot of side shear in the rock socket and 150 KSF of end bearing in the bottom of the rock socket. Now that is the initial design and not the uh, at the tip elevation of 632, when we recalculated that at uh, the elevation, tip elevation of 645, we were closer to about 100 kips per square foot. The actual results from the load test showed that the side shear in the less competent sandstone was closer to this two kips per square foot. In the more competent sandstone, it was about 40 kips per square foot. And our end bearing was 90 kips per square foot. So slightly below what we had estimated at the higher tip elevation of 645. 
So this table summarizes all of the differences between the initial design and the final design. For most part, it appears, uh, for most of the substructures, we did decrease the shaft diameter, piers two and four. Pier three, we did choose to go with a larger diameter shaft structure there, um, a little bit of gaining some redundancy in design between piers three and four. But also the biggest difference that I wanna point out is the second numbers here in these lower two rows, which are the planned and actual depth of socket within the more competent sandstone. As you can see here, we cut the value at pier two to in, uh, by a third or by two thirds. We're about half of the planned length at pier three, and we're about 10% of the planned length at pier four. So significant reduction in the lengths of socket that we were having to install for these shafts as a result of the test results. I've mentioned a couple of times less competent and more competent sandstone. And whenever I'm discussing that with people, one of the questions I receive is, well, how did you tell the difference between the two? And it was pretty easy when we got into construction. The less competent sandstone shown in these upper two pictures had a significantly different color than the more competent sandstone, more of a, a whitish buff color relative to the tan and gray color of the more competent sandstone. But it also looked completely different both on and off the auger after being uh, spun off. As you can see, it's kind of more the less competent sandstone that is, is kind of more of a, a beach sand type of look to it, you know, not really having much in the way of structure to it. Whereas the more competent sandstone definitely exhibited more of a, a blocky structure, both on and off the augers. So now getting into the costs and uh, another demonstration to many of the points that Van illustrated with his presentation. We did not, as Van said in his, construct this bridge twice, even though we did have a northbound and a southbound bridge but we did design it twice because we had the initial design and we knew what it was going to cost to do that initial design. We also know what it actually ended up costing us based on the revised and final design that we had. So for this project, uh, Case Foundations had a cost uh, for both soil and rock drilling of $45 per cubic foot, which meant that our initial design was gonna cost over $15 million. All of the load testing that we instituted cost us $583,000. And that cost includes constructing both the initial test shaft, abandoning that one, and constructing the actual test shaft that we utilized. So the total construction cost, including the test shaft, was just about just a little bit over $7.7 .7 million, resulting in a savings of just over, excuse me, a total cost for the project of the testing and construction being $8.3 million, with a total savings then being $6.8 million. Now that's nice and, and that's all fine and dandy and a great way of looking at things once you know what the actual end results are and the costs. But as Van pointed out, sometimes you need to evaluate and identify those costs earlier on in doing the comparison costs and looking at what Van presented as being the, the foundation support cost method of doing that. So we've got four different components that go into this as Van discussed. The available support cost, which is the installation cost, divided by the factored pile resistance. Then we've also got the utilized support cost. The difference between the available support cost and the utilized support cost is that with the available support cost, we're looking at the available resistance. And with the utilized support cost, we're looking at what is the actual factored load or what is the utilized resistance. As Van pointed out before, we design a, a, a shaft or a pile for 100 tons or 200 tons or whatever it happens to be, but in the end of things, as Van pointed out with his you know, 5.4 piles per cap, you don't always utilize all of that available resistance. So that's the difference between the available support cost and the utilized support cost. The next cost, and I don't have it on here because we don't actually have that number from the contractor, is what it costs to construct the caps. That's just the total cost of the cap construction divided by the factored load on that cap. The cap sizes did change from the initial design to the final design, not a lot, but it was enough that I probably should have had final numbers if I was going to give you the full on uh, total support cost evaluation. And then we have the construction control support cost that, that Van discussed as well. And that's the cost of, of doing the load testing, the quality assurance and quality control divided by the factored loads that are under that method of construction control. 
So for our initial design, you add all of those up and you come up with the $39.42. Again, total support cost is just the sum of all the total foundation costs, the cap and the, and the individual deep foundation elements themselves divided by the factored loads. And then looking at our final cost, it was $21.61 per kip of utilized support, a savings of almost $18 per utilized kip of support. As Van discussed and Gerald pointed out earlier on, it's not just simply the cost of the construction that we are looking at, or the cost of the materials, the cost of installing these foundations, but also the potential time savings that can be a significant uh, cost and benefit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if I look at, or if we look at, what we were going to have for drilling length in the more competent sandstone, since that's where the length changed. The initial design had over 3,000 feet of drilling in the more competent sandstone, and we wound up drilling just 836 feet in the more competent sandstone. The observed drilling rate in the more competent sandstone varied between one to four feet per hour, meaning that we would have saved somewhere between 570 and 2,278 hours of drilling, or for a project that's going 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 23 to 95 days. So had we not done this load test on the program, the load test program, not utilized it, we could have potentially eliminated all of the joint ventures uh, incentive bonus of $140,000 per day. That savings is not worked into any of these costs or that incentive, that, that money that uh, the joint venture did appreciate is not built into that. So to summarize the results of, of this particular case history, load testing, it cost $1.52 per kip of utilized support. Yeah, that was $583,000, and it's a big number. If we'd gone to our client uh, and said, many of our clients, and said that we wanted to spend half a million dollars on their project, they probably would have balked at that, been reluctant to do so. But we can show in this project, in this case, that we saved over 10 times that value just in the material and construction costs, not counting the time value savings that we had of 23 to 95 days. So some other conclusions that we can pull out of looking at this, uh, as many of us understand, initial designs based on empirical values like we used for this one and utilizing uh, FHWA methodology uh, can be relatively conservative, um, but that's understandable, that's typical. As I mentioned, construction control, load testing, it can be expensive, as Van pointed out, easily dismissed because of that cost, but you now have two case histories showing how much potential savings are out there. The support cost method of looking at things provides a very beneficial uh, perspective to evaluate what the different costs are and where we might be able to gain an advantage by doing testing and where are we reaching that limit of diminishing returns that Van pointed out in his presentation. The time savings that's available is an important consideration that's not part of the actual support cost, not necessarily, as Van commented on, there's always incidental savings that's available um, or additional monetary considerations that aren't built into the cost of the foundation elements, the caps and those kinds of things, like having the structure open to utilize and, and be in production or have uh, traffic on it. Um, and the savings from a test can be many times the cost of the total testing itself. So this project uh, was the group effort in every sense of the words. Um, I'd like to acknowledge some of our partners that are involved, that were involved in the project and helped us put this presentation together. And I also need to point out that in addition to uh, presenting earlier, Van also was part of putting this presentation together and helping us write the paper and presentation uh, that myself and Morgan Race with my company put together for the International Bridge Conference back in 2017. Um, and with that... I